Good evening, everyone. It's Monday, July 17th. This is the Liquor Commission hearing for Wheeling. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Commissioner Vito? Here. Commissioner Kruger? Present. Commissioner Lang? Here. Commissioner Papantos? Present. Commissioner Vogel? Here. Commissioner Brady? Here. Chairperson Horker? Here. Okay. Citizens concerns and comments? Members of the public may address the committee with comments regarding only those items that are relevant to village business. No citizen shall speak for more than five minutes without consent of the committee. Members of the general public who wish to address the board must sign the request to speak form prior to the commencement of the public meeting. Mr. Kraft? Is this for the liquor? Is this for the liquor? Good evening, this is the Liquor Control Commission. Right. Um, could you, at some point, let, let me know how many um, Funeral homes have received liquor licenses since uh, a, few, did, a few months ago. Did you guys allow funeral homes to have? Yes, them? that's right. How many? There's been, there's been one. Just one? Yes. Okay, thanks. thanks. Mr. Allen? Thank you. Appreciate the time to discuss some topics with the board. Uh, my name is Kirk Allen. I'm co-founder of Edgar County Watchdogs. We're a local government uh, nonprofit group. Uh, we focus on accountability and transparency. Um, I would ask that you take a look into some of the FOIA requests that have been submitted. I understand we're already being denied records with some rulings that obviously are not something that's followed within the case law of the Attorney General. Um, I would hope that there's a little more effort towards transparency to find reasons to release those records because a lot of the exemptions clearly say you may exempt records for certain reasons and I think what we've asked for is pretty clear. So I would hope that there's a, a push and an effort towards transparency in that regard. Thank you very much. That's it. Oh. Thank you. Uh, Approval of the minutes, special meeting of June 5th, 2017. So second. Who made the motion? Okay. Motion, Mr. Lang. Uh, second, Commissioner Papantos. Okay. Roll call. Uh, Commissioner Vito? Yes. Commissioner Kruger? Yes. Commissioner Lang? Yes. Commissioner Papantos? Yes. Commissioner Vogel? Yes. Commissioner Brady? Yes. Chairperson Horker? Yes. Mr. Spondilis. Uh, Clerk Simpson, if you could read the. Um, consideration of a request for a Class BV liquor license from Elite Restaurants Group, Incorporated DBA Bellas Bistro. This evening, uh, you have the first of a number of requests for a liquor license, uh, all related to Bella's Bistro. The petitioner is here, and as the title indicates, this is a request for a BV liquor license, which approves video gaming as well. Uh, again, there's going to be a number of topics before you this evening, all for this restaurant. I think it's probably appropriate to have the petitioner answer any questions, should you have them. Hi. Uh, Commissioner Papantos. Hi, good evening. Can you briefly describe to the commission what type of training staff will receive, um, specifically Bassett training? All Bassett trained, all health certified trained, and they will all be obviously over 21, and they'll all be trained at uh, facilities that currently that will be open before wheeling. So Bensonville will be my training ground, which should be open in about two months. Wheeling is still probably couple months after that, but Bassett trained and health certified trained, health food certification. And what age, do, are you going to have any age restrictions up, as far as? Uh, legally, 21 and over is the restriction to hire because of the alcohol. Um, 
it's, I'm going to filter through the people. I want to hire locals. I'm not going to bring a staff here. I want to hire locals and stimulate the economy as much as I can. But our training will be done from my previous employees who will come on hand and train them further. But everyone should be local here. That's my goal. Are you planning on restricting the ages of people who enter your establishment? I would like to make it all ages because we're family friendly and we have a beautiful market and great food. That is my plan. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Papantos. Uh, Commissioner Lang. Thank you. So just for clarification, um, you'll have a shopping, you'll have wine on shelves and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, will the, your customers pick out a bottle of wine, maybe pick out something to eat, and then dine in there if they'd like or take it home with them? As long as they don't open that bottle of wine, which I don't want to deal with open wines going out, but as long as they could, we could serve a glass there from our behind the counter, if they want, to buy, buy, they want to buy a bottle, they can take it to go. It'll be separate. It won't be the okay, same Okay, so that's, that's, that's the yeah. clarification. So yeah, it won't be the same two bottle. Different, two yeah, different. I'm not going to seal it like Cooper's Hawk. I don't feel comfortable doing that. Okay. Thank you. Rob. Any other questions? Commissioner Brady. Thank you. You know, in your uh, dissertation, you, you talk about uh, serving complete meals on serving food, good food, and everything else. You have no cooking equipment here. Uh, it's it's a full Italian deli, meaning we have a full beet slicer, prep table, refrigeration. It's all full. It's all, you know, we're going to warm it up too. We're going to get a, we're going to get the, um, the panini press to make it warm. Oh. But everything we have is Italian market related. I'm not going to fry foods or anything. It's going to be all whatever we sell on the shelves. We can cook okay, it right so, there. Yeah. You know, in other words, sandwiches. And yeah, sandwiches. Um, all types of Italian sandwiches. Okay. All right. Thank you. Questions, concerns? Entertain a motion. So can, I, oh. can I make conditions to that motion? Uh, so could the motion be motion to approve conditionally upon three things? One, passage of legis legislation by the Board of Trustees granting applicable special use approval. Two, passage of an ordinance by the Board of Trustees authorizing the creation of a new Class BV liquor license. And three, payment of all applicable license fees. So moved. Motion, Trustee uh, Commissioner Lang, second. Second. Commissioner Papantos. Madam Clerk, roll call. Uh, Commissioner Vito. Yes. Commissioner Kruger. Yes. Commissioner Lang. Yes. Commissioner Papantos. Yes. Commissioner Vogel. Yes. Commissioner Brady. Yes. Chairperson Horker. Yes. I'm going to read the Class BV license into the record and just as to reiterate the point to you. Class BV licenses shall authorize the retail sale of alcoholic liquor in sit-down restaurants for consumption on the premises subject to the following. Conditions and qualifications. A Class BV licensed premises must provide a minimum table seating capacity for meal service for 30 persons, exclusive of all bar stools, and must serve lunch or dinner at least five days of each calendar week in which the establishment is open, must have a video gaming license issued by the Illinois Gaming Board in accordance with the provisions of the Video Gaming Act, shall comply with all provisions of the Illinois Video Gaming Act and all rules, regulations and restrictions imposed by the video Illinois Gaming Board and the operation of video gaming terminals shall not be permitted during the hours alcoholic liquor sales are prohibited as provided in section 4.32.2. Thank you, Mr. Spondelis. Uh, item six. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, the next item. Um, 6A, consideration of a request for a Class D4 liquor license from Elite Restaurant Group Incorporated, DBA Bellas Bistro. Mr. Spondelis. Thank you. This, cl this Class D4 license authorizes liquor by the package for consumption off-premises and is supplemental to the previously approved Class BV license. Commissioner Vogel. Yes. What type of packaged goods do you plan on selling? Just wine bottles. Just wine? All right. And is, is there two different fees for these two different licenses? Yes. Can you realize that? You'll be paying a double fee? Yes, I, um, I saw that. Okay. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Looking for a motion to approve. I have conditions again. 
Mr. Svondelos, the conditions. Uh, there are four to this one. Uh, so we would ask for a motion to approve conditionally upon the following. One, passage of legislation by the Board of Trustees granting applicable special use approval. Two, passage of an ordinance by the Board of Trustees authorizing the creation of a new Class D4 liquor license. Three, payment of all applicable license fees. And four, receipt of a Class BV liquor license. Those fees are a total of $7,500. Uh, for the BV license and $250 for the D4 license. So the total is $7,750. So moved with conditions. Second. Motion Commissioner Kruger, second Commissioner Papantos, Clerk Simpson. Uh, Commissioner Vito. Yes. Commissioner Kruger. Yes. Commissioner Lang. Yes. Commissioner Papantos. Yes. Commissioner Vogel. Yes. Commissioner Brady? Yes. Chairperson Horker? Yes, Mr. Svondelis. I'm sure everyone's excited to hear me read again. <laughs> Class D4, a supplemental package liquor. Class D4 licenses shall authorize the retail sale of alcoholic liquor by the package for consumption off the premises subject to the following. Conditions and qualifications. A Class D4 license shall be issued only as supplemental license to the holder of a Class A, AV, AV1, a1V, B, B4, B1, B1V, C, or CV license. The holder of a Class D4 license shall remain subject to all conditions, qualifications, and limitations of the primary liquor license class. The holder of a D4 license shall only sell, offer for sale, or give away alcoholic liquor in any form during the hours of operation specified for the license holder's primary license class in Section 4.32.2. In the event that the primary liquor license held by a D4 license holder is revoked, suspended, or declared fortified or lapsed by the Liquor Control Commission, the Class D4 license shall also be revoked, suspended, or declared fortified or lapsed. A Class D4 license shall not be issued in lieu of a more appropriate license contained within this section. That's it. Thank you. We look for a motion to adjourn from the Liquor Commission. So moved. Second. Motion, motion trustee, uh, Commissioner Lang, second, Commissioner Kruger. Roll call. Commissioner Vito? Yes. Commissioner Kruger? Yes. Commissioner Lang? Yes. Commissioner Papantos? Yes. Commissioner Vogel? Yes. Commissioner Brady? Yes. Chairperson Horker? Yes. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you so much. Don't go too far. You'll be up in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> you will during the regular meeting. I'd like to call the regular meeting of the Village Board for July 17th to order. It's 6.43. Okay. Roll call. Um, Chairperson. Trustee Vito. Here. Trustee Kruger. Here. Trustee Lang. Here. Trustee Papantos. Present. Trustee Vogel. Here. Trustee Brady. Here. President Horker. Here. Approval of the minutes for the regular meeting of May 22nd. So moved. Uh, Motion. Wait, wait, okay, wait. Trustee Vogel. Second. Second. Trustee Kruger. Trustee Vogel. Trustee Kruger. I think it was faster when you used a pencil. I think so. <laughs> Just saying. Okay. okay, are we ready? I'm ready. Trust, Trustee Vito? Yes. Trustee Kruger? Yes. Trustee Lang? Yes. Trustee Papantos? Yes. Trustee Vogel? Yes. Trustee Brady? Yes. President Horker? Yes. I would now be looking for a motion for approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of June 5th. So moved. Second. Motion, Trustee Vogel, second, Trustee Papantos. Papantos. Roll call. Trustee Vito? Yes. Trustee Kruger? Yes. Trustee Lang? Yes. Trustee Papantos? Yes. Trustee Vogel? Yes. Trustee Brady? Yes. President Horker? Yes. Are there any changes to the agenda? None this evening. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appointments and confirmations. Clerk Simpson. We're looking for appointments of Christine M. Maloney to the Board of Health. Malone, did oh. I just kill that name? 
Uh, we need a motion to approve the appointment of Christine M. Malone to the Board of Health. So moved. Second. second. Motion, Trustee Vogel. Second, Trustee Kruger. Are you Vogel Kruger? I believe so. Okay. Um. I'm generally looking the wrong way when anybody says that. Okay, Trustee Vito? Yes. Trustee Kruger? Yes. Trustee Lang? Yes. Trustee Papantos? Yes. Trustee Vogel? Yes. Trustee Brady? Yes. Trustee Horker? Yes. Clerk Simpson? Is she here? She is. Right there. Come on. Christine Malone. Having been appointed to the Board of Health. Having been appointed to the Board of Health. In the Village of Wheeling. In the Village of Wheeling. In the counties of Cook and Lake. In the counties of Cook and Lake. Who solemnly swear. Who solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties. Oh, okay. And I will faithfully I discharge the duties. Of the Office of Board of Health Commissioner. Of the Office of Board of Health Commissioner. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my Citizens concerns and comments. Okay. Rick Simpson. Members of the public may address the committee with comments regarding only those items that are relevant to village business. No citizen shall speak for more than five minutes without consent of the committee. Members of the general public who wish to address the board must sign the request to speak from form prior to the commencement of the public meeting. Mr. Kraft. Again, thanks for the opportunity to speak. I came here to speak after watching the disgusting video of your past public meeting where Trustee Kruger made it clear that she thinks people relinquish their First Amendment rights when they speak things she does not want to hear. Then later, Trustee Brady shouted, shut up, at a citizen in the audience. Um, I've also seen meetings where the village attorney continuously interrupts speakers at the podium. That is not his job, and he has no authority to interrupt speakers. Trustee Brady, maybe you should tell him the same thing you told Ms. Wilson at the last meeting. This type of behavior by public officials is unprofessional and uncalled for. Some quotes from decisions on the Supreme Court about First Amendment. The proudest boast of our free speech jurisprudence is that we protect the freedom to express the thought that we hate. A law can be directed against speech, a law that can be directed against speech found offensive to some portion of the public can be turned against the minority and dissenting views to the detriment of all. How about this one? False statements of fact do not fall within one of the restrictions on freedom of speech. Maybe I should repeat that one again. Ms. Wilson has determined that the village of Whaley needs some oversight, and I don't blame her. She's willing to provide that oversight. While the village board claims expenses uh, uh, for responding to FOIA requests, they failed to mention information gleaned from past requests. I'll cover a few of them. May former Mayor Argyris used the village credit card for personal purchases on two separate occasions. Former Mayor Ajaris used the village purchase card to support his private business interests on three separate occasions. Former Mayor Ajaris lied about his reimbursement to the village 
when questioned about the unauthorized charges on the card, he went so far as backdating the check in an attempt to somehow proving he actually reimbursed the village at an earlier date than when he actually did, which was January 17, 2017. Former Mayor Jerry reimbursed the village from a checking account of a business which had been involuntarily dissolved by the Secretary of State since 2012. Former Mayor Argeris used village vehicles for personal use and in the private business use in the course of his non-public employment. All of these are examples of violations of Article 8, Section 1A and B of the Illinois Constitution and can be used as predicates for felony charges. Pro public property, funds, or credit shall only be used for public purpose. Units of local government shall incur obligations for payment or make payments from public funds only as authorized by law or ordinance. None of those charges were authorized by any law or any ordinance. The use of that vehicle was never authorized by any law or any ordinance. Keep in mind you can't make an ordinance that conflicts with state law. There's no public purpose for his use of the card or the vehicle. But this board, previous board, swept it under the rug and tried to excuse his felonious behavior. You still have time to recommend to the Cook County State's Attorney to charge your former mayor for what he should be charged with, felony official misconduct for misuse of public funds and vehicles. Additionally, okay, let's talk about the issues of a cease and desist letter and other threats that you guys sent to surrounding communities, state legislatures, and the media. First of all, you voted to do something on behalf of the board at your last meeting that wasn't on the agenda. That violated the Open Meetings Act, in, in my opinion, and violations of the Open Meetings Act are Class C misdemeanors. I suggest you turn yourselves into the local police chief and have them investigate you guys for the crimes you committed at the last meeting, if they're proven to be violations of the Open Meetings Act. Additionally, the hate letter sent by Patrick Horner in at least 136 emails. Yeah, that's right, 136. I counted those like you counted the ones you received from her, each individual recipient. Subjected Miss Wilson to hatred, contempt, and ridicule, and accused her of committing crimes and included keywords like harassment, intimidation, abuse of FOIA, maliciously defame. Included information from her previous job, her alleged and still pending criminal charges, but failed to mention that the school district filed false police reports against her for made up charges of interrupting voice and electric, electronic communications. I FOIA'd the school district. Mr. Can I have Pratt? another minute, please? Mm, I drove I four hours to get here. I understand you're a long way to get here. Can you have 15 seconds? Go. The school district responded to my FOIA request stating there was never any interruption in services. That tells me they lied on that police report, and we're going to prove that. Um, additionally, you guys are denying FOIA requests that should have been honored, and then you try to accuse me of stalking a, a public employee. That's wrong. You guys know it's wrong, and you need to do something about it. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Mr. Allen? Thank you, Mayor, members of the board. Anybody tell me what time the regular meeting was scheduled to start for tonight? There was a liquor commission hearing first, so it gets pushed after the liquor commission hearing. Under the Open Meetings Act, all meetings required by this act to be public shall be held at specified times. I would ask that in the future you specify a time that your meeting is going to be held. I understand past practice, you may have always done it that way. I had no idea what time this was going to start or approximation because we have no idea how another meeting, how long it's going to take. Um, in regard to some of the things, we've been watching videos for about a, almost a year now. And one of the things we hear from a lot of public bodies with FOIA requests, it ties to a dollar figure. It says, oh, you're costing us this much money. I would ask, where in the budget did that change? 
Where was additional funds spent because of FOIA requests? And why is FOIA the problem? Because from what we found through our investigations of every public body, if there were no FOIA requests, nothing changed with the payment of that employee. They got the same amount of money whether they were doing FOIA requests or something else. And FOIA is an obligation. It's an obligation that takes precedence. Freedom of information is one of the most important things we have, as is our First Amendment. And I understand you folks don't have, have to answer questions. I can understand that. The Open Meetings Act doesn't require it. We do have legislation with counties and universities and schools that the citizens and employees have a right to ask questions. The purpose was to get answers to those questions. That was the le legislative intent. We're hoping that the Illinois Municipal League will move in that regard when it comes to these type of village meetings and, and city meetings as well. In regards to our First Amendment, do we have any veterans in here? Any veterans at all? Way back. One? I'm a veteran of the United States Air Force, and I can tell you, I can't believe the places we go and the things we hear that just literally trample on our First Amendment rights. They're the most sacred right we have. We have men and women dying defending this country and our principles, the foundation that we were standing on from our forefathers and our First Amendment right is sacred. It is absolutely sacred. And I believe a recent Supreme Court case even referenced hate speech is protected speech. And I know you may not like to hear some of the things and some of the accusations, and some may be spot on and some may be absolutely off the wall. But there's other ways to deal with that than to tell people you can't talk anymore or tell them to be quiet. I would, I just pray that you focus on understanding the importance of that right. Because these cameras, although you're used to it, and you may not go back and watch the videos, they get broadcast all over the place and they get shared. And when they see that type of behavior, it's a negative for the community. The last thing I have, and it may have been a prerequisite on the Liquor Commission, I noticed when the gentleman read uh, the criteria on the first one, um, he read three requirements. But on the agenda that I downloaded from the website, it had item number three, and it may be a requirement that I'm not familiar with has already been complied with, satisfactory results of criminal background checks. Is that a requirement before you can apply? Because those requirements were void in the resolution that was read, but it is on the agenda. I would hope that we're not just negating that as part of the, the process. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Clerk Simpson. Um, Mr. Meshek? Meshek? I'm sorry, it was for 501B. Pardon? I registered for 501B item. Oh, so when the item comes up, you, you want to speak? Okay. Ms. Wilson? reading for you um, an article that was published in the journal Topics uh, in 2014. Wheeling police charged a village woman with battery after she allegedly provoked a neighbor response, a pepper spray response from a neighbor. Alexandra Smolina, age 30, of 1606 Brittany Court Wheeling, was taken into custody near her home at 7.20 p.m. Saturday, March 8th. She allegedly entered the garage of another woman on Brittany, threatened to kill her, and poked her in the face with fingers. After several such alleged pokes, the victim picked up a can of pepper spray and used it on Smolina to thwart the attack. Um, I was the victim. That was a repeated entry, attempted entry into my home. The police report states that the perpetrator was to be charged under state statute 720-5.0 forward slash 12-3-a-2 battery personal uh, contact with hands and feet and um, criminal trespass to residents. The fact pattern of this actually is felony burglary. Um, 
The perpetrator broke, broke the glasses right off my face. I have custom made uh, moisture chamber glasses. This was uh, their third repeated attempt into my home, this time succeeding. Um, and uh, the fingernails took out a part of my eyeball. I didn't know your eyeball grows back. It took four months, but I got four months of ophthalmic treatment. I reached out specifically to Mary Kruger with an email, uh, home invasion not charged properly. Um, later, in a FOIA, I found out that the perpetrator was not charged and there was all this redacted information why the person was not charged. Uh, I believe it's because the perpetrator had a license to practice medicine and had privileges at the same hospital as our village manager. Um, when I asked him why he didn't investigate it, Whole decision is is very divorced from. So did you job. you have the authority to appoint mm -hmm. or terminate the chief? Yes. Okay. Based on stuff that I sent you or any other thing, did you did your evaluation reflect how he handled that? I mean no disrespect when I say this. Mm -hmm. I didn't know who you were. He didn't know who I was. His statutory duty is to investigate complaints into the performances of all departments. And he told me he didn't investigate it because he didn't know who I was. I have, I believe that a very good man left this place because of the corruption involved in this case. His name was John Tevens. I put my complaint into John Tevens. He signed a complaint and gave it to Benson. Benson refused to sign it and turned it over to Wolf, who was only too happy to say after telling the newspaper that they were going to charge the person with a misdemeanor crime that the person was taken into custody, that they felt no need to do that, that they were charging as a local municipal ordinance violation, and that moreover they were using the social worker's advice to tell them how to charge this crime, a person who was not on, on the scene, ignoring patrolmen. Uh, Jenke and Hurtis were on the scene. And when I came back from the ambulance, they were in my garage. They were looking at the garage where I pepper sprayed the person. And uh, they had no idea I was walking up behind them. And, and Jenky says, but, but, but Sarge, but Sarge, the, the husband admitted to me his wife went in the garage to confront her. And he says, you know, he, he ignores him, doesn't say anything. So he repeats himself, assuming that his sergeant must not be hearing him. Upon a sex, repeating the same thing, he looks at his watch and says, you haven't had lunch yet, have you? And he sent him home. Jenky uh, and, and, her, and, and this man, Conway, a man whose position was reclassified to be a sergeant, went to such great lengths to make sure that this woman didn't lose her license to practice medicine. He climbed into that bus. Do you know how tight the quarters are in an ambulance? Told me I didn't need to go to the hospital. I told, because it was just the pepper spray. And he turns to all the guys, he says, right, fellas, and Mr. McIsaac's yes man said, oh, yeah, it's just the pepper spray. Ms. I went a few hours later, and I had a big chunk in my eye Ms. that required months of ophthalmic treatment. He aided and abetted felonious behavior with the misappropriation of resources, and it seems like anybody can get out of a felony, get out of jail free card, if you know John Spondilis. Ms. Wilson. And I was... Please. Suffered subsequent attacks in my home after this and the stalking of her six foot four inch tall husband. And if any of her vulnerable patients at Elgin Hospital suffer a battery because of her, you can tell them it's because you thought it wasn't necessary, Mr. Spondilis. Your time is up, Ms. Wilson. Thank you. I have, a, I have an in office email from Elgin with your wife's name Ms. Wilson. in the same list of people who have licenses to practice medicine. As Angelic, that Smolina woman. But I guess Ms. she does surgery, she's more. <coughs> Ms. Wilson, everybody gets time. Clerk Simpson. It's a consent agenda. Consent agenda, Clerk Simpson. Okay. 
Uh, consent agenda. All items listed on the consent agenda are considered to be retained by the village board and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussions of these items unless a board member or citizen so requests, in which event the item will be removed from the general order of business and considered after all other agenda items. 11A, resolution approving a one-year renewal of the contract with h, h Electric Company for street light maintenance and repair service in year 2017 in the amount of $20,000. Item 11B, resolution accepting a publicity publicly bid contract with Maintenance Coding Company for the 2017 Pavement Markings Program in the amount of $44,774.81. Item 11C, resolution accepting and approving a construction engineering service agreement with Baxter and Woodman for inspections of the Northgate Parkway sidewalk improvements and Wolf Road bridge repairs in the amount of $29,700. Item 11D, ordinance authorizing the village president and village clerk to execute an intergovernmental agreement among the member agencies of the major case assist assistance team. 11E, resolution granting a tag day permit to the Wheeling Firefighters Association to conduct a tag day event on August 18, 2017. 11F, resolution authorizing acceptance of the suburban Purchasing Cooperative previously bid contract with Call One for a five-year contract for telecommunication services in the amount of $135,600. Item 11G, resolution on authorizing the village president and village clerk to execute an amended and restated intergovernmental agreement establishing a joint emergency telephone system board with the city of Des Plaines. Item 11H, Ordinance Amending Chapter 4.32 of the Village of Wheeling's Municipal Code, Alcoholic Liquor Dealers, specifically Section 4.32.085, to increase the authorized number of Class BV and Class D4 licenses. Concerns or questions from the Board? Let make a motion to approve. Motion, Trustee Vogel. Second. Second. Trustee Brady. Roll call, Clerk Simpson. Uh, Trustee Vito? Yes. Trustee Kruger? Yes. Trustee Lang? Yes. Trustee Papantos? Yes. Trustee Vogel? Yes. Trustee Brady? Yes. President Horker? Yes. We have no old business, so new business. 13A, presentation regarding financial results of fiscal year 2016. Mr. Mondeshane, you're at bat. Good evening, um, <clears throat> excuse me. A few months ago, I, I gave the board a brief update of where we finished 2016, specifically with respect to the general fund. And tonight I'm back to go into a little bit more detail. Um, now that you've received the comprehensive annual financial report um, and have had a, a look at the results. So, as I go through my slides, feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. Okay, so as we talked about a, a few months ago, you'll recall that in the general fund for 2016, we had a balanced budget. Uh, we budgeted um, mm -hmm. revenues and expenditures to be the same. We finished the year um, with a surplus of $152,521, which was a great result. The actual surplus, if you'll recall, was a little bit more than that. It was 402000 But on staff's recommendation, the Village Board decided to transfer uh, $250,000 of the surplus to the pension funds in order to pay down our um, unfunded liability. So it would have been 402, ends up actually being 152 because of that. And um, you'll see that revenues were about one point. 8% higher than budget, and um, expenditures were 1.4% higher than budget. And I'll go into the reasons for that in a minute. Um, revenues were up primarily due to two one-time only sales tax transactions that totaled about $554,000. If not for those two transactions, sales tax revenue would have been down 
um, 1.79%. And when we dive a little bit deeper into the revenue, you'll see, um, again, sales tax was up because of those one-time transactions. Um, income and state use tax was below budget by 385000 uh, Property tax was about what we expected, and then there's the other categories as well, so there's that 1.79% of budget. One of the things that I wanted to point out with respect to sales tax is that for the last few years, excluding the one-time transactions that I mentioned, sale, the sales tax base in Wheeling has only grown by 0.7%. Uh, so less than 1%, and income tax has only grown by 1.04%, and that's something I'm going to talk a little bit more about later because that's going to create some issues for us going forward. You compare that to expenditures, which are expected to grow by 3.3% annually, and that creates a gap that we're going to have to address beginning with the 2018 budget. On the expenditure side in the general fund, um, again, we were a little bit over budget. Um, in most categories, we were pretty close to where we budgeted. The one that stands out is in FICA, IMRF, and pensions. And again, the reason we were over budget in that category is primarily because we contributed the additional $250,000 to the pension funds, and that was not budgeted um, because we didn't plan to do that. And um, in the last category, we were a little bit over budget in what I call the everything else category because um, the board during the year decided to spend some money on holiday lights, and that was not originally included in the budget. But otherwise, we were within 1.4% of the budget and amount, which is a pretty good result. So just wanted to show you what sales tax revenue has looked like for the last several years, and, and you can see that in 2016, it was down by 5.63% compared to the prior year actual amount. And the reason for that is because in the prior year, we received um, four of these one-time only sales tax transactions and didn't receive as many in 2016, so that was the primary reason. But if we look at 2017, um, through the first four months of, that we have data for, our sales tax is down 2.19% this year, excluding those one-time transactions. Uh, in 2016, it was down 1.78%, excluding those transactions. And since 2014, we've only had 0.1% annual compounded growth, um, which is creating some, some budget challenges for us, or will create budget challenges for us going forward. And similarly, with income tax, um, receipts this, this year are down 4.66% or about $100,000 through six months of 2017. Um, it was down 8.5% in 2016 compared to the prior year. And when we've, we've tried to ask the Department of Revenue for an explanation of why income tax is down, there's a couple reasons they've given us. One is because they, they have stated that they made a change in terms of their accounting software, and it has to do with how they're allocating um, income tax between personal property tax receipts, personal property replacement tax receipts, and income tax receipts, and that there was an issue with their accounting software that created a discrepancy there. But the one of the primary reasons is that the corporate income tax receipts in Illinois um, were down 32% year over year. And that, I think, more than anything is the reason why we have not seen um, significant growth, or really any growth for that matter, in income tax revenue. And I wanted to show you a couple of charts that um, I, I borrowed this from the uh, Illinois Policy Institute, which got it from the Pew Charitable Trust. Um, and what it shows here is that since the Great Recession, which is going back to about 2007, Illinois has had, um, I think there, we're tied with Nevada for the worst um, overall personal income growth in the country. And I think this explains more than anything why 
not only Wheeling, but all communities in Illinois and the state itself are not seeing growth in income tax receipts. Um, it's because income is not growing in Illinois as, as much as it is in other states. Um, and you've probably all heard about the, the fact that more people are leaving Illinois than are coming in to Illinois. And, and another chart from the Illinois Policy Institute shows that um, Illinois is the worst in terms of in differential in income of people moving out versus people moving in. And there's about a $20,000 difference there. So there's a lot of pressure on municipalities, including ours, um, to, to be able to balance our budgets given that income tax is not really growing in Illinois. And in our case, the same can be really said of sales tax as well. Um, this chart just shows the increase in property tax revenue that has occurred over the years. And this is largely a function of, of what we just talked about. When two of our three largest sources of revenue, income and sales tax, are really not growing, it's put tremendous pressure on the village to increase the property tax levy. Um, beyond what we would ordinarily like to increase it. And so you can see that that has risen steadily over the years because of that factor. And then I just wanted to show you a historical view of our general fund surpluses and deficits. And you can see for the last, I guess that is nine years, we've had five years of deficits and four years of relatively small surpluses. Um, in large part, not because we're adding new programs and services, it's, you, this reflects really status quo in terms of expenditures, but because of the pressure that we're experiencing with revenues not growing. And so when we look at the general fund fund balance and we try to project that out for the next five years, you see kind of it dropping off. We, at the end of 2016, we had about a 37% fund balance in the general fund, which is well, be, be, well above our 25% minimum requirement. But I'm projecting that uh, to drop off in, in, in future years unless we do something to adjust our expenditures or adjust our revenues. And in this case, these uh, uh, projections assume 3% increases in property tax revenue and 2% increases in sales and income tax, which his, is historically higher than what we've actually um, seen in the past few years. So uh, as we prepare for the 2018 budget, and we've already had discussions about this at the staff level, we're, we're facing some challenges to make sure that this doesn't actually happen and that we don't reduce our fund balance by that much. Switching over now to the water and sewer fund. The water and sewer fund is in good shape. Um, this projection out to 2021 assumes moderate increases in rates. Um, our fund balance policy requires a 25% fund balance, and it tends to fluctuate from year to year based on the number of capital projects that we do. But we have really no concerns with respect to the water and sewer fund. And then this chart shows that our water use uh, in Wheeling has actually stabilized. Um, if you went back be before 2009, you'd see that at one point we were selling 1.6 billion gallons of water annually. That started to drop off um, as people started to use more efficient appliances and so forth. But, but now we're right at about 1.2 billion gallons a year, and it's been holding steady for the most part for the last several years. So that's a, that's a good development. Michael, would that have anything to do with the meters, the new meters that we are? We really haven't seen, we, we, as you were referring to, we implemented a new meter system. We haven't really seen any significant change in, in water billing as a result of those new meters. But the meters are much, much more accurate than what we had before. Um, just by virtue of the fact that they're they're new. So, um, switching to the 911 fund, at the end of 2016, we had a rather large fund balance. The policy here requires a 15% minimum. We were well above that at 82%. And if you'll recall, over the last several years, we've been subsidizing the 911 fund by transferring general fund money to it every year to offset the cost 
of um, red center expenses and emergency equipment, 911 equipment and so forth. Um, as it turns out, we haven't spent a lot of that money, so that money will be available this year um, to use to offset dispatching salaries in the general fund. And the reason why you see a bunch of zeros on this chart is because um, you just uh, tonight approved an intergovernmental agreement with Displains with respect to the Joint Emergency Telephone System Board. And what that means is that we're now going to have a joint board with the city of Displains for the purpose of administering 911 funds. So we're going to be accounting for not only Wheeling's 911 money, but also Displains. And as a result, my recommendation is that we no longer maintain a, a fund balance in this fund because we're going to have to account for our money and their money. And I don't want there to be any uh, debate about whose money is sitting in fund balance. So I'm going to come back probably in a few months and recommend that we had, um, change that policy so that <coughs> revenues equal expenditures every year and that there is no balance in the 911 fund. If there were ever an emergency and we needed additional funds, we could always take it from fund balance in the general fund. Michael, is the 911 um, tax going up according to the state? Did I just read that? Yes, the, the state just um, passed a law or a bill increasing the 911 fees from 87 cents per line to $1.50 per line. And we expect to hopefully to see some of that increase. It could mean as much as $200,000 more to the village of Wheeling on an annual basis. And it would also be you know, more money for every other community, including displays, of course. Is that just for cell phones, or is it for also landlines? My understanding was that that's just cell phones. Thank so. you. Um, and then switching to the liability insurance fund, this is a success story for the village of Wheeling. Um, our fund balances in this fund have been growing steadily because our our losses, our workers' compensation and general liability claim losses have been much less than expected. So our fund balance policy says that we need to have 200% of annual claim expense. And as you can see by these numbers, we have much more than that. Um, and we're projecting much more than that going forward. Um, so we can lower that fund balance and return some of that money to the general fund and the water and sewer fund, <coughs> which will help us balance the general fund budget going forward. This is a chart that shows what our workers comp and general liability losses have been by year going back to 2007. And you know, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. That's predictable in, in a way because you have good claim years and you have bad claim years. And we know that that's going to happen. But in general, the average um, over the last uh, 10 years or so has um, fallen out at $487,000 of losses per year, which is really a lot better than it used to be. It used to be over $700,000 a year on average. And I really think that's a credit to a lot of the things that we've done, particularly um, the departments deserve credit for a lot of the training that they do and other things that they've implemented in terms of equipment and safety measures to reduce the number of primarily workers' comp claims that we have. Um, back in 2006, we hired an actuary to do a study to predict what our losses would be going forward so that we would know how to properly fund the liability insurance fund. And based on their projections back then, we should be expecting annual losses at this point of about 1.5 million. So to be under 500,000 is really remarkable. So that's, that's a good story. Um, oh, and then I just want to cover some of the other major funds. Capital Projects Fund um, it does not have a fund balance policy. We have a number of projects budgeted in the next four years, including $7 million in street improvement projects, uh, almost a million in sidewalks and, and street lighting. And then, of course, the Fox Point Relocation Project, which is funded by grant money. So there's about $17 million in projects. Um, that fund balance is going to fluctuate from year to year, also based on the number of projects we're doing. But um, 
this money comes from the gas and electric use tax and we are able to pay for our infrastructure improvements without issuing any debt which is which is great the um, now I want to switch to the to the TIF districts uh, the TIF funds Crossroads TIF um, expires in two years and um, we had a negative fund balance at the end of 2016 um, but we we are planning on having positive fund balances in the in the future by the time the TIF ends in 2019 um, every year we declare 72 percent of the increment as surplus and return it to the other taxing districts including the school districts and um, if there if this money is not allocated to any economic development projects by the end of 2019 we can either transfer it to another TIF district for economic development purposes or declare it as surplus and return it to the other taxing districts the Lake Cook Milwaukee TIF is a huge success story for the village of Wheeling um, as you know it includes the Weston Hotel and Prairie Park and Millbrook and um, those projects have been very successful and as a result um, we are projecting large fund balances going forward because at the present time there is nothing budgeted um, in terms of major projects other than the diversionary channel bridge project so the only other expenditure that comes out of this fund um, is the debt service on the Weston bonds but there's still a lot of money left over um, after we make those payments that can be used for other economic development projects and then the South Milwaukee TIF is a is another success story uh, it expires in 2023 we declare a surplus every year equal to 45 percent of the increment and we are projecting that this too um, this fund balance as well will increase in the next few years so there's flexibility there to uh, fund projects or again declare additional surplus southeast tiff is a um, relatively new tiff district so there's small fund balance is projected for the next few years simply because there hasn't been enough time for increment to be created there but you can see what that looks like in the next few years and we do have um, one project budgeted the industrial lane water and sewer, sewer improvement project that's budgeted in this TIF district and then here's the uh, town center TIF 2 project um, again a fairly new TIF so not a, a ton of money in here but there are, is money to pay for um, a couple of projects that are budgeted the berm and basin at St. Joseph Church and Northgate and um, the Northgate Parkway Dundee Road signal upgrade costs are, are included in these numbers as well and then I'm not going to spend much time on the capital equipment replacement fund other than to say that we had a 4.8 million dollar fund balance at the end of 2016 we budgeted the full contribution last year and this year and um, we're back on track in terms of making our contributions to the surf fund and being able to pay for the replacement equipment without having to borrow money and then I wanted to just highlight the status of the pension funds at the end of December or, uh, December of 2016 and what you'll see here is for each of our three pension funds the amount of money that the fund had at the end of the year what the total liability was in other words what we owed to the pension fund at that point and therefore what the unfunded liability was and our percent funded and as you've heard me say before you know these numbers are not where we would like them to be we would like these the, the funded percentage to be higher we're trying to address that over time and it, it takes a lot of time to address that the board has declared surpluses for the last couple years and contributed an additional 1.25 million dollars above what we were required by the actuary to uh, contribute so we're doing the right things to get us where we need to be um, which is 90% funded by 2040 so overall we're about 70% funded on an aggregate basis which is not all that different than our neighbors um, but still like I said we still would like to be higher than that 
Excuse me. And then I, in terms of 2018, I just wanted to point out that our contributions to our three pension funds are going to go up by about $275,000, or 5% over what the budgeted contribution was for 2017. And when we talk about budget challenges, this is one of our challenges. Because as I've said now a few times, um, our revenues are not growing by 5%. But yet, in the case of pension fund contributions, those are going up by that much. And health insurance is a similar increase, um, health insurance costs. And then, you, of course, you've got wages and, and so forth, which are rising at a higher pace than our revenues. <clears throat> so that makes balancing the budget very difficult every year. Um, and then I just wanted to conclude, <clears throat> excuse me, with um, just talking about the state of Illinois budget. And by now, everybody's probably aware that the state implemented a 32% increase in income tax revenue. And um, unfortunately, for municipalities, we're not going to see any of that. That's all going to be retained by the state. We're going to continue to get the same amount of money on a percentage basis as we have in the past. And in fact, the budget bill that was passed by the state recently, um, within the last week or so, includes a one-year only 10% reduction to the local government distributive fund, which is the money, which is income tax revenue. So beginning really now and continuing for the next 12 months, the village is going to receive a 10% less, and so is every other community for that matter. And that's going to cost Wheeling about $365,000 um, over the next 12 months. The bill passed by the state also includes a 2% sales tax collection fee which is a, a new fee that is intended to help pay for the services that the Illinois Department of Revenue provides to municipalities when they collect sales tax on our behalf. So for the Village of Wheeling, it applies only to the home rule sales tax and not, the, not our share of the state sales tax. But that is a permanent fee that is going to cost us about $80,000 annually. And again, just creates another challenge for us in terms of balancing our budget. And then as um, Mary, Trustee Mary Papantos uh, mentioned before, the 911 fees are going up. And we haven't heard exactly if that means we're going to see all of that increase, but I do expect we'll get some of it. But it could be an additional $200,000 in revenue for us. So as of now, there's no property tax freeze. There was nothing done in terms of workers' compensation reform or pension reform. Um, but we're not ruling out the possibility of a property tax freeze because that was a big component of the governor's turnaround agenda and something that, that we still need to be concerned about because if that happens, that would change things dramatically for us in terms of our ability to balance our budget. And then beyond that, I just um, you know wanted to reiterate that, you know, challenges that we have going forward are you know the, the sales and income tax issue and the fact that the that our primary sources of revenue are not growing at the same rate that our expenditures are again the proposal to freeze property taxes is still on the table the village has like many communities has very large pension obligations we have a f almost 58 million dollar unfunded pension liability um, that we need to address over time. And I just wanted to point out that you know, significant increases in services or staffing levels would, would inevitably lead to deficits again, so we need to be concerned about that as well. And I um, wanted to give you an update on where we're at in 2017. Um, and we had budgeted, if you'll recall, a $51 or $52,000 surplus for 2017. This year, it looks like we're on pace for a um, almost $400,000 deficit. A lot of that has to do with what I have talked about now in terms of sales tax and income tax not growing this year. Um, and also the 10% the income tax cut that was included in the budget bill is probably going to cause us 
to have a deficit this year. That $365,000 that I referenced earlier um, is probably going to lead to a deficit in, in our case. So um, with a fund balance being at 37%, we can certainly weather that kind of, uh, of a deficit, but I wanted to be, make you aware of where we're at. That's all I have. I'm happy to try to answer any questions you have. I have one question. Trustee Lang. So Michael, um, we have several nice housing projects that are in the works or have been completed. Um, would we be better off in the future, or I want to phrase this right, to concentrate on housing because the, the income tax seems to be lower in that. W would it be better to concentrate on housing or more retail in our future? Yeah, that's a great question. And if you ask me what I would prefer, I'm always going to choose retail over housing because it results in sales tax revenue for the village. Whereas m most of the housing projects that the village has undertaken in the last 10 to 15 years have um, been built in TIF districts, um, which is great. But the problem from our perspective is that we're not able to capture any of that increase in property tax revenue in our general fund. So um, it puts a lot of pressure, especially on our public safety departments that have now have to respond to additional calls for service at the same time that we're not getting any more revenue from that project and, and won't get any more revenue until the TIF district ends. Um, so if you can imagine a, a project that is created at the beginning of a TIF district, like in our town center TIF, um, that's only three years old, we won't see any revenue from that project for potentially 20 years. We'll see property tax increment that goes into the TIF fund and can be used for other economic development projects, but nothing that's going to offset the cost of having to pay for firefighter salaries and police officer salaries and so forth. But our, the housing projects that we've put in are in some ways increasing our demographics in this town, raising our demographics to a level where other retails retailers would probably be considering wheeling where they wouldn't in the past. Is that I, I think that's say? fair to say. I think, um, you know, th these type of housing projects with the town center development are definitely going to benefit from additional residents living in wheeling. Um, to that extent, it's going to create additional sales tax revenue for us. But probably not enough to offset the increase in expenditures that, that result, you know, from just salaries going up every year and pension costs going up every year and health insurance and so forth. But as housing goes, we're on the right track. We're, we're bringing in housing that's, that's bringing in a higher demographic. And, and that help, certainly helps. I think that's a fair, it's balancing, fair statement. It, it's balancing the community better as well. Right, I think, I think that's fair to say. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Monshine. Thank you. Okay. Um, 13B, ordinance granting special use site plan approval for a sit down restaurant, 25 Huntington Lane, Wheeling, Illinois, Bellas Bistro, docket number 2017 5A. And please read C as well. Madam Clerk. Hmm? Can you read C as well? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Right. I'm looking, trying to do my, oh, never mind. I, I don't see, you. pardon? I saw you. Okay. Um, Ordinance granting special use site plan approval for packaged liquor sales at 25 Hunting Lane, Wheeling, Illinois, Bella Bistro's docket number 2017-5B. Mr. Jennings, please. Thank you, President Harker. 
these two items both relate to the uh, the items that were in front of you earlier as the Liquor Commission. Uh, they're both related to Bell's Bistro uh, by the zoning code. These are two separate and distinct special uses, so we're uh, proposing uh, on your agenda you'll see two uh, voting items, one for each ordinance. The first is for the special use for the restaurant itself, uh, which includes the on-premise service of alcohol. The second ordinance is for uh, package liquor sales, uh, which as I said is a separate and distinct uh, special use in our zoning code. The plan commission has recommended approval uh, just before I ask the petitioner to come up. Uh, as you move uh, from the front of the store, which you see in the photograph here, as you move from the front to the back, uh, you pass through a market area uh, into a food prep area that has a bar. You see a bar stool area there. Uh, there's a dining area to the, uh, to the right of that. And then the gaming area is in the rear of the store. Uh, the plan commission has uh, reviewed this at a public hearing and has recommended approval of it. Uh, both ordinances have the same two conditions of approval. I'll read them for you. Number one, that live entertainment is permitted on an occasional basis. And number two, that business hours shall be consistent with liquor licensing. Uh, with that, I would ask the petitioner to come forward uh, to answer any questions you may have. Questions from the board? I'll ask one. If Mr. Lang? Uh, Mr. Lang? Pending uh, approval tonight, how soon do you think you'll be uh, in business ready to open? I already texted my, <clears throat> I already texted my mom and the architect <laughs> that I'm, I'm hopefully getting licensed. So he'll go there tomorrow probably and get the drawings and uh, or get the, the plan. And he made this concept, but it takes him six weeks to get drawings. Then I submit that to the city of Wheeling. And then my contractors come once I get bids, which takes about two weeks. So eight weeks from now, they will submit the electrician, plumber, or contractor. So then construction starts eight to nine weeks from now, and construction takes three months, from my experience. Great. So we're looking at five to six months, realistically. Well, best of luck. Looking Thank you. Looking forward to having you in the village. Thank you so much. Any other questions? No other questions. Trustee Kruger. Thank you. Hi. Um, can you clarify your hours of operation? Uh, we like to start off at about probably 10 a.m., 9 or 10 a.m. I got to go over that with my the manager that I hire and the local manager, but we like to close probably around midnight on the weekdays and later on the weekends. Doesn't that coincide with your liquor license? Yeah, well, that's. I'm assuming we're not, we're not going to go past the liquor license hours. Okay. But it just depends on business. Wintertime is not busy, so we may start off normal and expand later as we get busier. But then the liquor license hours. Great. Thank you. Motion to approve uh, 13B. That was Trustee Vogel. I'll second. Second, Trustee Lang. Roll call. Trustee Vito? Yes. Trustee Kruger? Yes. Trustee Lang? Yes. Trustee Papantos? Yes. Trustee Vogel? Yes. Trustee Brady? Yes. President Horker? Yes. Looking for a motion to approve 13C. So moved. Second. Trustee Lang, second by Trustee Papantos. Roll call. Trustee Vito? Yes. Trustee Kruger? Yes. Trustee Lang? Yes. Trustee Papantos? Yes. Trustee Vogel? Yes. Trustee Brady? Yes. President Horker? Yes. Good luck, Mr. Bala. Thank you. You're not reading? I'm not reading this time, no. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you guys for believing me. Thank you, guys. Madam Clerk. Um, 13D, D. ordinance granting preliminary plan unit development, special use, site plan and building appearance approval for a mixed use retail and residential plan unit development at 501 was Dundee Road, vacant parcel, address to be reassigned, docket number 2017-3. Mr. Jennings. Thank you, President Horker. The petitioners here uh, have a few things to go through first. Um, the, the first of which uh, relates to the address to be assigned. This is a vacant parcel. The address that is assigned to it is not consistent with our address range. Uh, the petitioner has been informed of this. Uh, we expect that sometime between now and the final PUD, should this be approved uh, this evening, 
that they would uh, consider uh, possible uh, address assignment and, the, and there's a good possibility the project might be renamed. Uh, as you look through the materials, the, uh, the previous plan unit development on this property was referred to as Wheeling Station. Uh, it might be a little bit confusing. The, the market study that was submitted uh, refers to this project as Wheeling Station. There's a supplement to the market study that was uh, submitted in July that also refers to the project as Wheeling Station. It is all the same project. It is this Uptown 501 project that you'll be uh, reviewing this evening. The plan commission has reviewed uh, the proposed plan of development and recommended approval of it. It is a mixed use building uh, at the northwest corner of Dundee and Northgate. It is a uh, wrapped parking garage with 264 residential units and uh, 12,000 square feet of retail. The, uh, the conditions of approval, which I will read in one second, uh, really set up the expectations for the final PUD submittal. Uh, there is one item that is a supplement to the, the original submittal. Uh, during the plan commission hearing, there was a request from the commission uh, regarding the size of the studio units. Following the plan commission hearing, the petitioner did submit some additional information to us uh, in support of their request for a a uh, reduced size of the studios, uh, which is a reduction uh, noted among the code relief for this PUD, um, and they can certainly answer questions relative to that if you have them. Um, the, the ordinance that you have in front of you lists uh, multiple conditions of approval, again, um, setting up the framework for the final PUD should this be approved. Uh, number one, the final PUD submittal shall address the specific items from the fire consultation and engineering consultation as summarized in the staff report. Number two, the final PUD submittal shall include a more specific tenant mix table for the retail space in order to establish a maximum ratio of restaurant space and reflect any use guidelines contained in the redevelopment agreement, also demonstrating how the parking demand will be met by the proposed tenant retail mix. Number three, the final PUD submittal shall provide a summary of the outcome of the preliminary meeting between IDOT, the petitioner, and staff. Number four, building elevations for the north facade shall be very similar to the residential section of the Dundee Road south elevation. A plan shall be provided at final PUD. Number five, for the materials identified as accent brick B and field brick A, real masonry as opposed to cement panels shall be used. Number six, Final PUD submittal shall include a delineated irrigation plan. Number seven, final PUD submittal shall identify the designated guest parking and land bank parking areas. Number eight, final PUD submittal shall include detailed floor plans. Number nine, final PUD submittal shall include a snow removal plan. Number 10, consider adding a water feature to the southeast corner of the site. Number 11, Final PUD submittal shall provide greater detail regarding townhome elevations and interior courtyard elevations. Also, all elevation plans shall be in color with materials clearly labeled. And the last condition, 12, consider adding pedestrian amenities to the fire lane. And with that, I would ask the petitioner to come forward for questions. While the petitioner is coming forward, Trustee Lang, you have some questions? I do. Uh, first of all, for staff, um, just you know, th this area was heavily floodplained at one time. Uh, um, what what steps did the we took steps to to uh, move a lot of that out of the floodplain? What uh, can you go through some of them? Uh, because we were able to, or they're able to build on quite a bit of this land now, which is awesome. Well, some of those steps are still pending. If you, if you read through the uh, engineering consultation that's referenced in the first condition uh, of the uh, ordinance, there is a portion of the flood way uh, that the petitioner is going to work to remap. Uh, to the first part of your question, the, uh, the village did undertake a significant study. Uh, we revised several of the uh, uh, FEMA um, flood panels uh, for that area. I would say we did that between 2003 and 2005. Feel free to correct me if anybody knows the exact date, which did reduce the amount of uh, floodplain in this general area. Uh, the previous PUD did, uh, did come through after that work was done. Unfortunately, the market didn't, uh, or fortunately for this petitioner, the market didn't allow for that project to go forward. Can I reserve the rest of my questions till after he presents? Sure. Thanks. 
Trustee Mary Kruger and then Trustee Papantos, you're next. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, first of all, thank you for uh, accommodations that you guys made to the fire department and engineering requests. I know that there are a few more um, I's to dot and T's to cross, but I'm confident that you'll uh, get through those. Um, I'm, I'm probably preliminary in asking, but I'm, I'm so excited about your site. Um, any LOIs yet? Anybody you're talking to? Anyone who's talking to you? I'm Joe Mashek with BSP Design. Um, there is a lot of interest. Um, and uh, Eric Diamond, who is with uh, UDA Development and is also part of Atlas, is um, a, a commercial um, broker in the, in the area. And uh, he's been shopping the site with a lot of interest. Great. Um, uh, on the residential element, I know that there is some pain with the square footage on the studios and perhaps the other units, but I'm going to trust your market study. I, I read that pretty clearly, and um, it sounds like these days less is more, as long as there is some amenity like the Sky Deck and Sky Lounge in your, in your plan that if I had a place to leave my four small walls and go work out or work remotely, um, you know, sitting in, a, in an area, I think I could, I, I think I could live like that. Um, I like the elements that you have of the planter boxes um, and certainly the sustainable uh, renewable uh, irrigation plan with the large um, uh, rain barrel basically on the, on the top that was going to, I thought I had seen that in the plan commission and as much as I like um, that uh, water conservation aspect, uh, solar and wind is the future and wondered if there was any talk about moving towards LEED certification or even just having more uh, environmentally happy uh, construction. Yes, and actually we are definitely looking into that as part of our team. We've got engineers looking into um, alternative energy uh, resources. It's moving so fast right now, whether it's uh, geothermal or um, solar panels on the roof, we're still uh, weighing our options. Um, solar tiles are, are weekly getting more and more tangible. So sure they are. Sounds good. And um, this, as far as I know that there's some also some pain about the address, uh, 501, 502. Um, I, I, I like five Uptown 500 myself, but um, um, as long as I don't say Uptown Funk, um, you know, I think we'll be okay. Um, anyway, uh, this is an evolution this in, in my eyes from concept to today's uh, uh, agenda topic as a evolution up, and I couldn't be more pleased, excited for to see uh, the uh, final PUD. Thank so, you. Good luck. Thank you, Trustee Kruger, Trustee Papantos. Thank you. Don't go away. <laughs> uh, first of all, the building looks beautiful. If this is what it looks like when you're done, and, and I hope it is, we're, we're going to be looking at this. This will be a benefit to our town. I'm a little disappointed um, when you came before us for concept. I believe the retail element was supposed to be about 25,000 square feet, if yes, I'm correct. Was. I've got a really good memory. You do. Um, we're down to 12,000. That's a big decrease. Why? The, um, th actually, it's the geometry of the site is the reason why we reduced it. Um, the, there is a change in grade as Dundee Road um, approaches the, uh, the, rail, uh, the rail corridor. Um, we analyzed it, took a close look at it, and with access and visibility, we wanted to create dynamic retail and not just retail. Um, we, we felt that it's too important of a site to have um, B-grade retail. Um, and so what we did was we focused the design and the space towards the corner where the visibility is, where the high demand is, and um, um, felt that it was much more important to have very um, desirable retail than just retail. I, I appreciate what you did as far as the, the market study that we asked for and the traffic study. Um, that extra turn lane 
going westbound on to turn right onto Dundee Road is a blessing for everybody. Anybody who's ever sat um, almost down to while and steel to tell you the truth on Northgate Highway at, at the wrong or Northgate Parkway at the wrong time can only appreciate that. Thank you. I too am very concerned about the size of your studio. Um, our code calls for 675. You're talking 550 by the time you put up cabinets, appliances, a bathroom, a dividing wall. It's going to be a very small little box. And, and I want this project to be a success. I want to see 100% occupancy. So please consider what you can do to make it a little bigger. I can answer part of your question, and, and what we're looking at is a range with 550 at the low end. The units that we've designed and the way they, the modules fit in the building between the, uh, the outer wall and the, uh, uh, the corridor, they end up being and typically around 600 to 620 square feet. But uh, as we get into the design with mechanical <coughs> closets and electric closets, we just, we, we, we'd like to look at a range so that we can provide a options great I, I ask this question of, of everybody um, assuming things go as planned and you don't hit any big glitches <coughs> what's the time frame because you can't have move-in until everything's done correct uh, yes and that we're if we if everything goes as well as planned and as is kind of as precise as things have been going because staff has been extremely helpful in this process to keep things moving um, 2018 perhaps end of the year um, given that we you know there's still some floodplain issues and some uh, infrastructure issues um, getting started great and and bringing up floodplain I'm, I'm sure you saw what happened um, the past week and you know our staff is great and we didn't flood here in Wheeling so you know who you're working with and I do want to compliment you also this is one of the most complete packets I've ever seen um, I don't think you're going to get a lot of questions because we just read it all so thank you very much thank you trustee Papantos Ken Brady thank you I really don't have any questions but some of us have spent a lot of time sitting here, whether at this commission or, or a board or a plan commission, and we've had parades of developers coming before us, all promising us upscale, you know, uh, raise the bar, uh, you know, aesthetically pleasing buildings. And I don't think we've had anybody come to us with out of the box design like this. It's unique, it's special. Nobody else is going to have one like it, I'll tell you that. And I want to thank you. For, for what you're doing and, and how efficient you're, you and your colleagues are at presenting this to us. It's really, really, it was a pleasure reading through it. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Brady. Trustee Lang, you're back up. Well, did you have any, did you have a formal presentation or is, are you just taking well, questions? Well, it, it just, I think questions is where the most things okay. get accomplished. Uh, and, you know, there's a couple of things that we did since we saw you, we saw you previously, I think it was in March, and working with staff and the plan commission, We've made a lot of adjustments to that original proposal, um, increasing the open space. Um, we added a floor so that we could shrink the size of the building a little bit, which was a concern, um, the, uh, the footprint of the building. Um, we've looked at programming the open space. So I think those are, that's really the, the nutshell. Right. And I read it pretty thoroughly, too. It was uh, e an easy read. Um, so a few of the things I really... Um, the design is incredible. It's, it's uh, something that, unlike what we've seen here in Wheeling, and I think it's going to go over very well in that corner. Um, I like what you've done with the parking. There, there isn't a parking issue, uh, you know, t so far. And you seem to be able to put enough parking into that area that will, will satisfy the needs. Um, and again, with that parking deck, you put it in the right place. You're using it as a kind of a block for the train and noise and so on. Um, and I also appreciate the fact that you landscaped on that side of the train as well. You have a lot of potential customers taking that train. And if they see a nice building and nicely landscaped, mostly, most of the, along the tracks is the worst landscaping or wor the worst scenery there is. But if you come across something nice, like someone will see here, they're going to want to live there. 
So, so good for you for doing that. Uh, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the next phase of this and, and getting going on this. It's a tremendous project. Thank you. Any other questions? Just Trustee one, Vogel. One quick one. You mentioned uh, a couple of other locations. Where's the one in Glenview? Uh, that's the, um, the, the reserve in Glenview. It's on Waukegan Road next to the Marianos. Okay. Uh, just to the north of the Marianos. Well, okay, that is it. Okay, that's what I thought. Beautiful, thank you. No other questions? I'd be looking for a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Motion, Trustee Lang. Second, Trustee Kruger. Roll call. Uh, Trustee Vito? Yes. Trustee Kruger? Yes. Trustee Lang? Yes. Trustee McCantos? Yes. Trustee Vogel? Yes. Trustee Brady? Yes. President Horker? Yes. Thank you, sir. Good luck. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Item E, Clerk Simpson. Resolution authorizing the village manager to execute a civil engineering service contract with Baxter and Wood Engineering for Wolf Road lighting in the amount of 56500 Mr. Janik, you're up. But one moment, Mr. Janik. Nice job with the water. <laughs> Is Lincolnshire catching up to us? Uh, there they are. Um, uh, the, the roads are all for mostly open in Lincolnshire. There still, still are pockets of water in Lincolnshire, but Milwaukee Avenue is open, for instance. Half Day Road is now open. It was closed. They will catch up with us. In the meantime, Civil Engineering Service contract, Mr. Janik. Thank you. Uh, this is a contract with Baxter and Woodman Engineering Firm um, for numerous years, and I'm sure the board um, remembers um, Wolf Road. Uh, reconstruction has been on the forefront of uh, staff um, and the uh, state, of, uh, state of Illinois, IDOT, for a number of years. Recently, um, two years ago, the board agreed to a jurisdictional transfer of a uh, section of Wolf Road that extends from Milwaukee Avenue down to Manchester. Um, that jurisdictional transfer would only occur after reconstruction of Wolf Road took place. A previous jurisdictional transfer of the of the of Wolf Road south of Manchester took place uh, numerous years ago. This would be a, a, a extension of that. As part of that reconstruction, um, the streetlights are part of the uh, design for the roadway. This contract would be a design contract and documentation production contract by Baxter and Woodman, who is the engineer for the roadway improvements. Um, it looks like. Um, the Wolf Road improvements, reconstruction, have been pushed up on IDOT's schedule, and it looks like it's possible that construction might start in late 2018 or early 2019. So the reason for this, for this contract is that uh, Baxter Women has submitted drawings to IDOT for review, and we need to submit uh, drawings ourselves for lighting. Questions from the board? Trustee Brady. Mark, do they have to be similar to the lights we have on our major streets? Because basically Wolf Road is pretty much residential the whole way that you've talked about, with the exception of a little piece up north. Do we need those high, uh, generic highway lights? The lights are, are intended to be the same design. I'm sure that Baxter and Woodman um, will take in, or the state of Illinois and Baxter and Woodman will take into account the fact that um, south, of, south of Dundee Road is mostly residential as well as there are some other detailed areas uh, of concern, such as the school access to the park district. Um, but right now, the design would be the same. It's an IDOT road. Um, we have um, similar fixtures on both Dundee and Milwaukee. And the idea is to have them similar in look. I'm not sure about the height and what the lumens are going to be um, required for those lights. I, I doubt they're going to put the same sort of strength of a, a fixture in the residential area as they are in the commercial. But I, I personally don't know. Well, I mean, it's, it's a different roadway altogether. Milwaukee and Dundee are major uh, uh, thoroughfares. Wolf Road has got to be a secondary or a third area or something uh, as far as high on, you know, on the list of highways and what the needs are of these different highways. The reconstruction of Wolf is going to be a three-lane cross-section. So it will be two, one lane each direction, then, then a, a center lane. Right. So it's, it's not going to be like Dundee. It's going to be curbed, 
the gutter, the uh, ditches will be gone. There'll be there'll be um, right. storm sewers, but but it is it's it's not a uh, regional arterial like Dundee or Milwaukee, but it is a a, a very heavily used roadway. It is. Um, so it, it's it's a major upgrade, obviously, and uh, the lighting is going to be. Um, I mean, there are, are IDOT specs. There there are IDOT requirements for lighting um, that we don't. They don't have that much control over them, but I'm sure that they will take into account the different land uses in the area. Okay. Thank you, Trustee Brady. Trustee Papantos? Yes, um, my concern was, as Trustee Brady's, that this is a highly residential area, um, so that there is some consideration for residents who either live along Wolf Road or, you know, right there that how how bright it will be in the middle of the night for them to be able to look out the window. I will tell you right now, Milwaukee Avenue, driving through the rain at night and having those lights was fantastic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and thank you for getting that project done. But it's also not a residential area as much. We'll make sure we talk to Baxter and, and make sure that, I mean, I assume that there are different requirements for residential and commercial areas. Thank um, you. But of course, you know, Dundee is a five lane road. I mean, excuse me, Milwaukee is five lanes. Um, but we will we'll talk to him. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Look for a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Motion, Trustee Brady. Second, Trustee Vogel. Roll call. Trustee Vito? Yes. Trustee Kruger? Yes. Trustee Lang? Yes. Trustee Papantos? Yes. Trustee Vogel? Yes. Trustee Brady? Yes. President Harker? Yes. <clears throat> Item F, 13. Um, F, resolution authorizing acceptance of Houston Galveston Area Council Purchasing Cooperative Contract GR01-15 with Trackless Vehicles Limited for a trackless MT7 and associated attachment at a cost of $145,219.05. Thank you. Um, this is a public course request to replace an, an aging vehicle that we use for snow plowing uh, for sidewalks. Um, right now the vehicle that, that this, is, this would replace uh, is 17 years old. Um, the village plows, currently plows approximately 26 miles of major roadway sidewalks. Um, this is a vehicle we, we've used, as, as you might have read the, the memo, We've used various vehicles in the past. We currently have two of these vehicles, two trackless vehicles. Um, we believe that these are the, the best vehicles to use. Um, given our snow, given the, the types of snow conditions that we have, uh, for instance, sidewalks close to IDOT roadways, and uh, we plow, and then a large plow truck will come and dump ice and snow again on the sidewalk and we have to come back and, and redo it. So um, I, I realize it's a lot of money, um, but um, it, this is a needed vehicle for our fleet. <coughs> Trustee Kruger. Thank you. Um, Director Janik, uh, there was one sentence in the memo that I wanted to focus on and that was the Spe specifically in areas where a private landowner or occupant can assume responsibility for this activity. How much roadway are we, or how much sidewalk are we plowing that really should be plowed by a landowner? Um, there's, it's a good question. Um, plowing sidewalks is, um, which ones we should plow and which ones um, maybe should be the responsibility of a landowner. Um, it is not it is, it's more of an art than a science because there's there's so many different land uses next to each other um, that's that sentence refers to some properties um, um, out, outside of let's say downtown Wheeling um, Milwaukee and Dundee that um, we, we've plowed in the past that are owned by say uh, housing developments that are on a major roadway um, and we need to I, I need to, to to come to you uh, talk to, to John and come to you with a um, with an idea of where I think we, we should be plowing and should not or concentrating on plowing and where we shouldn't be. Um, the village, village code does say that every property owner should be plowing their own area. Uh, it's 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 we do take on um, major roadway 
commercial areas. I think where safety is concerned, like, you know, kids that have to walk to the high school, whether it's snowing or not. Correct. Know, people, people walking down major roadways to different stores or mm -hmm. just to food stores, that, that sort of thing, back to, to our facility, to the park district. Um, so that, that sense refers to, to areas that, that we would like to um, transfer to property owners, not to individuals so much as larger um, properties. Fair enough. Thank you. May I add to that? This is an initiative that staff uh, started about a year ago to put together a map that is color coded with those two different, I guess three different things. Here are all the sidewalks in town. Here's what we're currently doing and we believe is the responsibility of the village of Wheeling and here is what we are currently doing but we believe we should notify the owners that it needs to be, it is their responsibility and we are no longer going to do it. Um, we've been working on that for some time and the plan is to come to the board as a discussion item because clearly that is a, a service level that we need to get uh, direction from, from the board. So that, that's something we're working on. Uh, obviously everything that Director Janik said is accurate. I just wanted to add to that that we're working on a discussion uh, item for the board to, to speak directly to that question. Fair enough, I'll look forward to that. Thanks. Thank you. Trustee Papantos. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Superintendent Spratt, for keeping the, the older unit working well beyond its um, useful life, I think, by at least five years, if I... That's correct. More than that. What's the lead time between order and receipt for this item? Um, actually, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, Chuck, do you have any idea? Three to four months, hopefully by Christmas. So hopefully we'll have it before, before the before. first snowfall? Yeah. <laughs> and um, in light of the current state budget and what we're looking at and what Mr. Mondeshane presented to us, I would really like to see um, more property owners taking care of their own sidewalks so that our staff can be where it needs to be. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Papantos. Any other questions? Looking for a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Motion Trustee Brady, second Trustee Kruger. Roll call, please. Trustee Vito? Yes. Trustee Kruger? Yes. Trustee Lang? Yes. Trustee Papantos? Yes. Trustee Vogel? Yes. Trustee Brady? Yes. President Horker? Yes. <clears throat> Item G, clerk section. Item G. <laughs> Resolution waiving competitive bidding and authorizing the execution of a construction contract with Peter Baker and Son Company for the 2017 Street Improvement Program, Phase 3, in the amount of $550,000. Mr. Spondulis. Thank you. Uh, I will be turning this over to uh, Director Janik in just a second, but I wanted to take the opportunity as part of the introduction of this item to emphasize the idea of this item. This is uh, something that Director Janik brought to me and to Michael um, to talk about borrowing from next year's funds in order to take advantage of this year's good weather and good prices and good crews. And so what you have before you, we're calling it phase three, uh, not of a single project that's been split into three parts, but actually the third extension of what the village will be doing from an infrastructure improvement standpoint. And all of that, again, is this constant initiative of trying to do the most with the least. And I wanted to be able to be the one to say that uh, before turning it over to Mr. Janik to describe exactly what the, uh, the item is and what the contract is for. So uh, again, this is something that staff works on in every department. This is just a great example uh, from Public Works of us trying to take advantage and get the most out of every dollar that we spend. Thank you, Mr. Spondilis. Thanks. Um, so what we're... What we're requesting tonight is that uh, next year out of uh, the, the CIP uh, roadway funds, which is approximately $1 million, we're suggesting that we, um, that you allow us to, to take, to borrow $550,000 for additional roadway improvement this year. Our contractor this year, Peter Baker and Sons, and the concrete contractor, D-Land, um, have proved to be excellent contractors. We have had uh, Peter Baker and Sons in town before. Um, and as you know, since we do public bidding every year for this sort of roadway work, we, we don't know from year to year who we're going to get. Um, getting Peter Baker, uh, excellent contractor. The concrete um, contractor is really good. 
but as you can see in the memo, the asphalt prices are approximately 15% below what they were last year, and the concrete is 40% below. So not only do we have good contractors, um, shown to be good contractors in phase one and phase two so far of our roadway this project this year, we want to extend this project into the fall and get um, Hollywood, uh, Hollywood Subdivision uh, 2, which is south of Dundee Road, done. Um, that, that would be um, roadways on both the east and west side of Schoenbeck. Um, they need roadway improvements. They need curb. Um, so that's where this, this money would go to. Um, right now, as, as you m might have seen, we finished uh, West Meadowbrook. Today, um, East Meadowbrook was ground. Uh, we're going to tack coat that tomorrow, pave it Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of this week, weather permitting. Um, then we're going to have to wait about three weeks, and then additional grinding in Old Town, substantial roads in Old Town. You might have seen, I know uh, Trustee Brady has seen numerous uh, concrete being replaced there. Those roads are going to get ground, and then this would be the phase three, um, Hollywood as well as Merle. This is not normally done, but we do have um, substantial funds for next year. We're not taking away next year's project, but I do want to borrow 550000 for this year. Questions from the board? I have one. So moved. <laughs> I have one. Um, so motion to trust I mean, this may be self-explanatory, but so there's going to be a reduction in next year's, I mean, budgeted amount that, that was projected already? That's correct. All right. That's correct. In the, in the CIP, we have $1,070,000 for um, CIP roadway projects. That doesn't include MFT funds. It's only 900000 But just for the CIP roadway, it's $1,070,000. So next year we'll have 520000 okay. in that fund and then another 900000 in an MFT. Okay. Yeah, to be clear, in case there's confusion, we are not adding additional money in aggregate. We're simply borrowing from next year's project to increase this year's overall project. But over the two years, we are not adding money in any way. Motion was made by Trustee Kruger. Any other questions? Second. Second, Trustee Vogel. Roll call. Uh, Trustee Vito? Yes. Trustee Kruger? Yes. Trustee Lane? Yes. Trustee Papantos? Yes. Trustee Vogel? Yes. Trustee Brady? Yes. President Horker? Yes. Item H. Resolution accepting a proposal from Hager Engineering LLC for construction supervision services of additional roadway improvements in the amount of 32,800. Mr. Svondilis. Uh, that would be Mr. Janik, sorry. That's okay. This is, this is essentially uh, the engineering contract for the previously discussed roadway program. So Questions? moved. Motion, Trustee Papantos. Second. Second. Trustee Vogel. Roll call. Trustee Vito? Yes. Trustee Kruger? Yes. Trustee Lane? Yes. Trustee Papantos? Yes. Trustee Vogel? Yes. Trustee Brady? Yes. President Horker? Yes. Official communications. Okay. Mr. Svondilis. <laughs> and you were so excited to change. You're, you're gonna so do excited. It? You're going to do it? I'm, okay. I'm not going to steal your thunder, I promise. Okay. I got excited that I get to go first, which means um, I get to, I guess, be the first uh, to, to thank staff. Obviously, uh, the village... Um, experienced one of the largest flooding events uh, in our history uh, last Tuesday with, depending upon where you live, six to seven inches of rain falling uh, within our municipal borders, uh, in addition to that much more significant rain falling up north, which as everyone knows has uh, a significant impact on what happens in our town. Uh, and I'm, I'm proud to be the one to say that uh, I believe the results which were altogether uh, very positive. Uh, we avoided some significant flooding in many um, vulnerable areas 
And I think that is due somewhat to uh, a little bit of luck. Mother Nature was on our side. Of course, there are a lot of things that contribute to whether or not one floods, but I think it is also uh, very important to note that a lot of preventative maintenance has been done in the last four years. Uh, a lot of infrastructure improvements have been made in the last four years. Uh, and, and it can't be overstated uh, how much effort has gone into dealing with flooding issues and trying to mitigate them before they become a problem. And uh, I would like to thank staff who, who was uh, available and working 24-7 uh, and the residents for cooperating uh, and being uh, cooperative with us in our response to the flood. And all in all, uh, the Village of Wheeling fared very well in what could have been uh, another disaster. So um, uh, thank you uh, to the board as well for allowing us uh, the funds in order to make some of those improvements. Uh, it is a lot of planning and it is a lot of work that goes into trying to get ahead of, of Mother Nature. One of the things, uh, I'm gonna steal Chief McIsaac's thunder here, one of, the, one of the things that we learned from the event is that we have a number of residents that um, are not signed up to receive reverse 911 communication. Uh, there were two areas in town that we did have to uh, deal with more hands-on, uh, and we did do a reverse 911 in those two areas. Uh, our system allows us to geographically identify areas and send the messages only to those areas. Uh, and we, we realize that there are a lot of people that haven't added their cell phone numbers to the reverse 911 system, and as people move away from their landlines, um, they're not getting the information. So uh, this is a plea, uh, a request to the public to please go to our website. Uh, it's found in two areas where you can register, uh, both under how do I on the top menu bar, there is a sign up for category and you will see code red emergency enrollment notifications. It is also available from the fire department page on the left side. Uh, again, this is all to help you uh, and really to help us help you when these situations occur so that you are up to date with all the, the most current information and when uh, the situation necessitates um, you know, uh, evacuation should be that be the issue uh, or anything else. So please um, uh, sign up for that. Chief, anything I, I missed in that regard? And uh, I think that's it for me on that topic. Uh, I do have one other thing uh, to ask of the board and that is uh, seeking a little direction uh, from the board. Several months ago, we had a conversation and a, a presentation actually that led to a conversation about uh, an access bridge at the 17 acres uh, at the parcel on the north side of town. And the discussion was about the type of bridge that would allow access uh, from Milwaukee to that parcel of land. And one of the things that I, I would just like clarification on is the timing of the construction of said bridge. The board agreed uh, in concept to what the bridge should look like. There were, I believe, three, maybe four options, three options. Uh, the board chose the one that they felt was most appropriate. Um, and the question has remain or is being asked actually by, by Trustee Brady. Uh, as to the timing of construction for that bridge. This is a TIF project. Uh, it was my understanding at the time that the direction was um, now that we've made a decision, we understand what the expectation is, we can relay that information to any potential developers uh, that the village is willing to uh, construct this bridge with TIF funds. Um, and I, and Trustee Brady is asking uh, whether it wouldn't be a good idea to build that bridge in advance of a develop a specific developer coming with a specific development uh, in order to maybe uh, spur a developer coming in. He would like to see that bridge put in uh, sooner rather than later. So I think this is just direction from the board, clarification on a previous discussion. Did I present that That's accurately? Correct. It's, it's direction. Okay. It's, it's not a a vote on a particular item, just direction. One of the things that is an option uh, is for your consideration is perhaps a resolution from the board that says that we are making the commitment to build this bridge when a development comes in. Uh, so really we have a couple options. We have build it now, 
wait until a developer has brought us a development that we want to support, so an RDA or a resolution that gives our support. So build it, wait for an RDA, or write and pass a resolution that says uh, we have made this commitment and that resolution can be used as evidence to a developer that uh, the board is participating in any future development. Can we say B and C? Well, <laughs> I mean, could that be combined? Because that, it would, if, if I might, you know, I happened to run into uh, Mark Smith at uh, Memorial Day Parade, and we talked for a little bit, and at that time he had finger, as we know, uh, was, was looking at this property, and he had a question about the bridge. And I said, well, the village has already committed that. We're going to put it in. Yeah, but they want to know when and, and who's paying for it, blah, 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 blah. Well, one thing led to another. Well, I, from what I understand, finger is out of the picture now, but, but there's other people looking at it, and, and what I brought to get tonight is probably the reason why we shouldn't wait to put this bridge in. Right now, there's only one access to this property, and that's on the off-ramp of Lake Cook Road. It's the only access to get in there. Now, if you start a development, you're moving trucks and equipment and, and concrete trucks and all in dirt in and out of there. That's going to be murder for anybody to develop. Uh, and if we wait until we get a developer and, and have all the, the, you know, the have this guy lined up, then start putting it our ourselves together to put this bridge in, what's going to happen is it'll take longer to get the bridge okayed through the, through the process than, than the development. And, and they're, 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 they're going to have problems getting into there. I'm saying we have to build this bridge highway specifications. There are going to be trucks, no matter what is built there, there's going to be trucks using this bridge. Let's build it now so that when somebody comes there and they, they like the property and they see that the bridge is going in, and they see, they'll see that there's you know light at the end of the tunnel, and they can get in there and do their thing at a reasonable amount of time. That the property would probably move better. Uh, if we don't, I don't see anything happening there. Nobody's going to wait for a bridge, and nobody's going to nobody's going to take an interest in in moving on to that piece of property with an off ramp access. Can you imagine what the trucks what they're going to have to go through to get in there, and what they have to go through to get out of there? It's you know, I do think it's only fair to mention that the trucks, other than garbage trucks, but construction vehicles cannot access that bridge through the easement from the ram. So I just, I just think that's important well, for this can, conversation. Well, not, maybe not through the ram parking lot, but they can come in off of Wolf Road. So the, the recommended options that seem to make sense were build it now, mm -hmm. um, wait for the RDA, mm -hmm. or simply have a resolution to to build it when the RDA comes in. Which can be used as evidence of our commitment in case there is a question uh, as there was from a carrot, exactly. Or possibly the combination of the resolution that says we're going to wait for the RDA. Why can't we build it now? Well, these are the options. We got, we got the you, money You would it. be in favor of building now? Am I right that we have the engineering system for it? The, the bridge is not designed, no. It isn't? No. I thought you said it was. The, the, the options are done, uh, and we, we, I guess that's option C, uh, is we could design it in advance. All of those options, though, kind of go hand in hand about trying to identify what the end use is going to be without knowing what the end use is going to be. Uh, Mr. Trustee Vogel has a question. You know, we went through this not too long ago where we were, we were kind of told we had to put the fixed South Milwaukee Avenue up in order for any developers to be interested in it and have it ground ready, okay, shovel ready. Well, we spent that money, ran into problems, went over budget. What's, I mean, is this the same deal? Same type of thing? We're just, we want to put a bridge in and then let people look at it? Or what? what's, I guess I don't understand. This, Trustee Brady is asking that we put the bridge in. Okay, but, but. I mean, we were, we were told by staff, recommended that we do South Milwaukee Avenue. Why, why were we in such a hurry? Why was the village in such a hurry to do South Milwaukee Avenue? But well, nobody was looking at it. And now we're kind of hesitating to do the same thing up there. 
this is a little awkward. For, staff, staff is not recommending that we build a bridge. But you know what I'm saying? What's the difference? They recommended we do South Milwaukee Avenue. We had to have it, it shovel ready, okay, and we had to do it right away. Oh, so in order to get people to be interested in it. So now what's the difference? Won't we want to do the same up here? There were mitigating circumstances on South Milwaukee. Uh, that is raw land, one, and two, what was pushing that effort were changes in the MWRD regulations. That was the biggest thing, that had we not acted when we did, separate and apart from whether or not there is a developer on hand, that it would have essentially rendered that land undevelopable because of the financial constraints of the new MWRD regulations. That's the biggest difference. I, I, I'm sorry, I misunderstood your question. That's the biggest difference between the South Milwaukee parcels and the 17 acres uh, uh, at Lake Cook. All right, and there's no nothing we need to consider. New legislation coming in that we're aware of that if we don't move there, we'll be affected in the same way. No. Okay. Um, Mr. Janik, you were squirming. That's exactly what I wanted to mention. What Mr. Spondula said. Uh, Trustee Lang, comments? So the, the bridge hasn't been engineered yet? Correct. Correct. So is it fair to say that it'll be engineered when we know what kind of use it actually would have? It could be, I mean, the initial plan was it was a three-lane bridge. It might deem to be a five-lane bridge if the use back there is, or a four lane at least, um, if the use is greater than the initial, um, you know, our initial thought for the design there. So we could actually have a, we could build a bridge that would be underutilized for that area. Is that correct? That's a correct statement. This is definitely about making sure that the best uh, the bridge fits the best use of that 17 acres depending on what development ends up on those 17 acres. This is, this is trying to make sure that those 17 acres are developed and used as best as they possibly can. And having an agreement in hand saying, we, we got the money, we got, we're going to build it. That's, that'll work with developers, Melanophy, John. We've um, worked with the developer on this site for several years now, and uh, obviously access has been a challenge. But the uh, you know most developers, it's going to take them time to build and to plan and so forth. So if we can assure them at the onset that we will build a bridge, but I have always been a proponent of we should have a, a development agreement in hand before we build a bridge that we might not know that it's going to be developed. It, it could sit there for 10 years, and then we have this bridge that, uh, you know, isn't being utilized. So my stance on this is we tell developers that the village is committed to building this bridge once a redevelopment agreement is signed. I agree 100%. Uh, any other questions relative to the bridge? I would like to pull the board. Uh, uh, how, like I'm sorry. Ask, how long is it going to take to... From, from start of engineering to, to getting out there with a shovel and start building a bridge, would you say maybe a year and a half, two years, getting all the, all the uh, federal requirements, Army Corps of Engineers and everything else that go along with uh, crossing a, a waterway? I, I would say uh, our Wheeling Town Center is going to take 18 months to build. So as, if that's some example of what timing would be, would depend on the uh, ultimate land uses on the 17 acres. So I think we could build a bridge in that time frame yeah, in right. conjunction. Wheeling Town Center can be building here because they have access all the way around. They have one, one, one driveway in there off of an a, 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 a exit ramp. That is not access. Did, did that answer your question? Would you like Mr. Janik to maybe follow up on that? specific to the... No, no, I, you, you gotta, guys do what you want. If you ever want to have 17 acres developed, you better give the developers a, a chance to get in there. Okay, so option on build it now or a resolution, wait for the RDA. Trustee Brady. Now. Now. Are you tallying? Mm-hmm. You can get, yeah, tally. 
Trustee Kruger. Just Wait for the RDA. Trustee Lang. Wait for the RDA. Trustee Vogel. Resolution. Trustee Papantos. Resolution of support. Trustee Vito. Wait for the RDA. I would wait for the RDA. You, you need to know what you're building. Thank you. And, and uh, I guess lesson learned, we should have asked this question specifically so we could have avoided some confusion at the uh, result of the presentation however many months ago. So uh, thank you. And, um, and certainly please contact me if you have any other questions. Clerk Simpson. Okay. The, this year we're going to be doing something really different with National Night Out. It's going to be held at Heritage Park with the co cooperation of the Village of Wheeling, the Village Police Department, and the Park District. It's going to be held on August Tuesday, August 1st, from 6 to 8.30 p.m. And then rather than having it in multiple locations, it's going to be at Heritage Park. Um, each com eight communities across America celebrate National Night Out on the first Tuesday of August. This year, the Village of Wheeling's Police Department and the Wheeling Park District are teaming up to reach out to the community in a big way. National Night Out is basically a giant going away party for crime, said Wheeling Police Chief James Dunn. With the challenges facing law enforcement today, we see National Night Out as a great way to bring police and the community together in a positive, enjoyable way. This event will provide residents with an opportunity to meet and mingle with representatives of the Wheeling Police and Fire Department, as well as representatives from state and local government. Um, they're going to have vehicles on display for the Police, Fire, and Public Works Department, as well as Chicago Executive Airport, a canine de demonstration from the Police Department, uh, free giveaways, free entry into the Wheeling Aquatic Center, free live music entertainment, free gifts for the children, informational booths for learning more about the Wheeling Police Department, as well as other village and state agencies, food and drinks, and fun. Uh, the Park District's going to sell food at their concession stand, and Wapagetti's is also going to be out there selling food. The event is open to everyone and requires no reservation. Please note that in the event of inclement weather, the event may be canceled. Please contact the Crime Prevention Unit at 847-8. 4592645 with any other questions. Thank you, Clerk Simpson. My turn. Mayor Helmer from Prospect Heights. Thank you for coming. I understand we worked very well together through the flood. Some of your representatives were here in Wheeling. I, I would imagine how, you, you guys probably fared fairly well for. Mayor, if you don't mind, could you? Thank you. I'm going to keep your comments short because technically you're not allowed to speak. Don't, don't offer a <laughs> microphone to a politician. But, uh, I'll cut you off. <laughs> uh, I'm very impressed tonight with what, what I've seen. I've learned some things that I've been doing most of what you've done or you do. So I'm very pleased that I had the opportunity to come here. And yes, we did have some meetings. I think we'll be along just fine. And uh, there'll be some needs on Wheeling's part. There'll be some needs on Prospect Heights' part. And whatever those needs will be, we'll work it out. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Helmer. Um, over the course of the last few weeks, um, fingerprinting on the uh, license applications for businesses in our town has, has come to my attention. A couple of businessmen have sent uh, questions regarding fingerprints and background checks on our general business applications. Mm -hmm. I would like to poll the board whether or not it would be worth our time to have a workshop on the issue of continuing this practice. Um, Trustee Brady? Yeah, absolutely. Have the workshop. Trustee Kruger? I agree. Yes. Trustee Lang? Yes. Thank you. Trustee Vito? Sure. Trustee Papantos? Yes. Trustee Vogel? Sure. Thank you all. Um, that concludes my interest. Will do. Thank you. Other pardon? Will do. Thank you, sir. Um, Trustee Vito, Trustee Papantos, you're next. Uh, well, the floodwaters did not uh, escape Chevy Chase, unfortunately, and we were having the chamber golf outing there, the Wheeling Prospect Heights chamber golf outing on Thursday. Uh, we actually moved it to Old Orchard. Uh, it'll be on Thursday at 11:30 at Old Orchard uh, instead of uh, Chevy Chase. Uh, hopefully. 
it's not too big of a uh, blip in anything and we, we run it smoothly. So if you're planning on playing, if you talk to anybody, you know, some of the um, regular players that you, you know would probably be out there. We did send out emails, but just in case they didn't get it, if you could mention it to them, uh, I'd appreciate it. Um, the reverse 911 calls, I did get them. Chief McIsaac is the best for that, because even when he's giving good news, it sounds ominous. Like, <laughs> the water is receding, but we're all going to die. It was, it, was, it was pretty good. I, I liked it. I was, I was paying attention to it. Um, but it was a good job. Uh, unfortunately, the golf course did not survive, but it's a lot better to be on the 10th on the green than it is in somebody's business or home. So good work to everybody. Thanks for all your effort. Thank you. Trustee Papantos. Thank you. Um, I, I've got to join the bandwagon. Um, Director Janik, your department is awesome. I have lived in Wheeling all my life. It is the first time that I can remember during a major flood situation that Wolf Road at Highland was completely passable. Um, Meadowbrook West was more than happy. Um, you know, and that's the subdivision I grew up in. You know, people were in and out and not flooding. Um, as I mentioned, street lights on Milwaukee Avenue may seem strange, but in pouring rain, being able to see where you're going, it really, really makes a difference. And I've got to thank the fire department and police department and every single department in this village who did their share. And if you weren't out there watching floodwaters, you were, you know, filling in and doing the rest. Um, and all of it is under the direction of managers Fondelis. So thank you. We were all kept up to date. It was great. And Director Janet, could you just let people know the Heritage Park Basin? Um, people asked me, and I'm certainly no engineer. How does it work, and was it working as expected? Um, okay. the, the way it works is uh, the, the the basin on the uh, along Wolf Road, which is the East Basin. That basin begins to fill um, through a spillway that's on Buffalo Creek. That spill that spillway. Um, allows water to, to pass over once the water gets to the very bottom of the Jeffrey Avenue bridge. I mean, it's, it's not based on, the, on, the, on that bridge, but that just so happens to be the way the design is. So um, the water will get to the bottom of the Jeffrey Avenue bridge, the spillway, the water then goes over the spillway. And theoretically, it will fill the East Basin. After that, it will start filling basins the soccer fields and, and that sort of those basins that are farther west, they'll fill those up. Um, so that, that's how it basically works. What happened in this particular storm, uh, in 2013 we got a lot of rain right in Wheeling as well as north and west of us. Not, not so much north, but northwest of us. This particular storm was in Wheeling but it was also north of us. So um, in this particular case, um, the Buffalo Creek, because it's been widened, by the Heritage Park improvements. That held a lot of water, and the, the diversionary channel was in effect and, and dealt with Buffalo Creek there, lower, lower level there. The spillway was only used um, probably 10% of the time. If the water had risen any higher, it would have, been, would have filled that basin on the, on the east side. So it, everything did work as planned. I'm sure some people would rather have that spillway lower to start filling it before it did. For instance, in West Meadowbrook, Meadowbrook Lane had some water on it at the elbow there. And it was not really passable. But you're right, West Meadowbrook was um, devoid of water. Um, uh, a lot of it has to do with our staff and the work that they do. But um, that spillway, it, everything did work as planned. Thank you. Um, Post office and mailboxes, can somebody tell me, they, they, it's, it's a tease, they, they got the new mailboxes so we can drop our mail off <laughs> and they put plastic over them and, yes. and won't let us use them. I mean, why? <laughs> and who do we call and complain to? Thank you, uh, Trustee Papanto. So we spoke, uh, I should say, I spoke to uh, the post office the other day and um, they're waiting for some scanning codes some stickers that go on the box when they collect the mail and so they would like to get those open it's just uh, they have a procedure that they're following um, I spoke um, 
with Lilia Sandoval, who is the postmaster, and so she's trying to implement those the uh, utilization of those drop boxes as soon as possible. I, I'm, I, I guess, you know, the term snail mail now has a whole new <laughs> meaning for me. I, I'm sorry, but you, know, you see the boxes out there and, no, we can't use them. And for somebody who lives on the east side of town, we have to turn right out of the post office and then turn back into it to go around to get out to the light so we can go back home. Um, you know, that or make an illegal left-hand turn. I'll but. place a call to them again tomorrow to um, get a more specific time frame. Um, they would not commit to a time frame, uh, but as other than as soon as possible. Thank you. You're welcome. And um, I'd like also like to thank staff. Um, before it rained, we had a July 1st celebration at the airport um, with Prospect Heights, and once again, wheeling shined. Um, it was a great day. I heard nothing but positive comments from my neighbors who went to it, and everything seemed to have run very smoothly. And for those of you who donated blood last week, um, thank you very much. There is a critical sh shortage in um, our state, and there is a need. So if you got out there, thank you. And if you didn't, think about it. Um, I believe it's next November. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Papantos. Trustee Lang, Trustee Kruger, you're up next. Thank you. Um, Great job with staff um, on the uh, water crisis um, and this board as well um, for um, proactively uh, addressing that water uh, years ago. Um, I also want to say thank you to staff again for the July 1st uh, celebration. It was a great day out there. The run in the morning was a wonderful run, a lot of participants. And then followed up that afternoon with uh, an evening with uh, uh, great entertainment, fireworks, something really that this community should be proud of, that we have an opportunity to have something like that. And so, John, I, I know you were very in instrumental in making that happen, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Lang. Trustee Kruger and Trustee Brady are up next. Thank you very much. Um, rock star hats all the way around. Um, uh, Manager Spondilis on the uh, Rock and Run the Runway. Again, everything pulled together. I don't know what strings maybe Mayor Helmer pulled to get that weather, but it was beautiful. Um, and the flooding um, and, our, and our big rain event, I don't think I've ever wanted to kiss a civil engineer more than when I drove out of my street the, the, the next day after that torrential downpour and didn't see any water. Nothing breaching the road. Um, that is a testament to certainly this board um, for th that lift station. I've taken more pictures of that lift station than I think I have of my dog. Um, and then Buffalo Grove even made, you know, some some efforts and spent some money in maintaining their basin. And all of that culmination and Lakeside Villas spent, you know, private money to fix their. Uh, situation with their retention on their site and all of that culminating together was was just remarkable I mean I don't I don't want to say we're cured but but <coughs> it's certainly a remarkable thing to see and um, like I said rock star hats for everybody it just it makes it, it makes me really proud to see how this whole entire village all staff levels pull together during a time of crisis and help everybody um, that's it, and except um, Clerk Simpson, I'm really glad you brought up National Night Out because I am so pumped and excited about going this year because I just think it's going to be like it was promoted, the biggest block party next to Rock and Run the Runway. So, so I just hope more. I just hope a lot of people go to this. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Kruger, Trustee Brady. Trustee Thank you. Google, you're up next. I too spent a couple of days riding around looking at uh, some of the areas that have been in years past, devastated by flooding. And the only problem areas I found were where people don't know enough to go out and with their rake and, and uncover the manhole covers with, with the leaves, and, and the problem goes away. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure seeing all the years of, of planning and, and, and trying to put something together that would work, you know, and seeing this happening to where years ago, wheeling was just going to just fill up every time it rained. We used to have maybe three or four hundred year rains per year when I first moved into town. But anyway, uh, 
my wife, my daughter, and I started last year. It's getting worse this year. Our allerg allergies have been killing us. And I can't ask why. It's almost down to where it's asthma, you know. And the other day I'm pulling out uh, onto Wolf Road and I look across. We have a weed ordinance. The park district's retention ponds, the weeds are about four or five foot high. And I don't think that should be allowed. The, 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 the church, we made our ponds there and we mow the grass all the way around them. There's no weed standing there. But uh, is there something we could do on that, Andrew, uh, Mark? A lot of what you're seeing are actually uh, natural plantings yes. that were intentionally done uh, with the, the, the design for the Heritage Park improvements. So uh, we can double check and make sure that the areas are as they were shown on the landscape plan, but a lot of that was intentionally designed uh, to be that way. Natural landscape are weeds, mm -mm. And, and that's what most of us are allergic to, you know. I, I don't understand how we can, I, I, somebody dropped the ball on that because we, we give people tickets for having weeds that are too high, and yet we let the park district grow them four feet high. We will, as Director Jennings said, we will definitely check uh, the landscaping plan to make sure that what is actually there is what's supposed to be there and not just overgrown and, and otherwise missed. And if we, if we need to do enforcement, we absolutely will. And if we don't, what do we do? We can't uh, enforce sneeze. It. We have to move. I'm telling you, it's, it's brutal. That west wind comes across there. What is it? Department of Natural Resources gives out some of that stuff. Uh -huh. Yeah, the, the yeah. plantings are, are from uh, IDNR. Yeah. Uh, good. Trustee Vogel. Uh, I echo everybody else's comments about the uh, great job everybody did with the rain. Mark, did we ever get an indication or an idea how much fell? I mean, it was like radios were saying for. Yeah, the first hour it was you know, equivalent it, to five inches, and it's crazy. The uh, the, the amount that I think it was was around five point seven five inches, but it's it's amazing how it can fluctuate in different areas. Uh, but I think that six inches, five and a half, six inches, six and a half inches is around what we got. Yeah, how do they? I mean, the, the one guy on the radio said that the uh, the first hour it averaged five inches for the hour. Um, I mean, like 15 minutes, you get an inch and a quarter rain, and then the next hour you get another. They went like five, four, five, three, and if you add all those numbers up, it came up to like 20 inches. But are they uh, are they saying that? What, what are they saying? What he said? I didn't I didn't catch any per hour, but okay. I think it was probably around half an inch an hour. An sometimes hour. That, yeah. that that's a very hard rain. Is it okay? <coughs> yeah, that came down pretty good. Again, thank you to everybody. Thank you. There's nothing else. No one has anything else to say. Let's move on to the bills. We'll make a motion to approve. Second. Motion, Trustee Vogel. Second, Trustee Kruger. Papantos. Yes. Uh, the mayor. Roll call. Um, Trustee Vito. Uh, yes. Trustee Kruger. Yes. Trustee Lang. Yes. Trustee Papantos. Yes. Trustee Vogel? Yes. Trustee Brady? Yes. President Horker? Yes. Thank you, everyone, for going, being here. We are going to recess to executive session for the purposes of pending probable and or imminent litigation and collective negotiating matters. You all are welcome to stay, but we're going to go in the next room. Need a, motion. need a motion to recess to executive session. So moved. M motion. Second. Trustee Kruger, second. Trustee Papantos. Roll call. Trustee Vito? Yes. Trustee Kruger? Yes. Trustee Lang? Yes. Trustee Papantos? Yes. Trustee Vogel? Yes. Trustee Brady? Yes. President Horker? Yes. See you all in the next room in a few minutes.